And welcome to our inaugural first annual Central Minex keynote speaker luncheon with special guest, Mr. Eric Sprott. Joining us today are our very special guests, the Honorable Andrew Fury, Premier of the Province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and the Honorable Andrew Parsons, Provincial Minister of Industry, Energy, and Technology. My name is Brad Eisen. I am the Managing Director of Landmark Surveys, and I am the current Chair of the Gannon Area Chamber of Commerce. It's great to see everybody came out today. This is a little bit bigger than our normal chamber event, which we usually all fit around one table. <laughs> so uh, really great to see everybody out. Thank you to everybody for supporting the event. Um, I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to start out to, to today's event sponsor, Rally Drilling. Uh, anybody here from Rally? Can you stand up, please? When we first started out fundraising for this event, and uh, we started out uh, down here at, at, you know, our budget was very uh, thin coming out of COVID uh, as a chamber, and uh, these sponsors, especially Rally, uh, really brought a lot to the table to elevate it and get things uh, up here and allow us to build this event. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to ACOA, uh, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, the town of Gander, uh, Appleton, Grand Falls, Windsor, Deer Lake, Port of Basque. I think I, I may have missed somebody, but uh, all these regions I, I, I saw supported at this event, and this is a type of collaboration that we need to see between municipalities and regions uh, to make these type of events a success. So, so thank you for being here. Uh, to all our sponsors, exhibitors, delegates, speakers, volunteers, uh, our event manager, Amanda McCollum. Uh, can you stand up, please, Amanda? Our, our never resting event manager, thank you, Amanda, so very much. I'm going to try not to miss anybody here, but uh, Hazel Bishop, Dave and Kelly with the Town of Gander, uh, Sheldon with uh, PES, Sheldon Gillingham, uh, Jess Keats, Lorelai DeWire uh, with, the, uh, with the Chamber. Thank you. Uh, this was a heavy lift for us for a small chamber, so thank you very much for, uh, for all the work you did. Uh, central, uh, regional, all the regional communities here, the Gander and Exploits, uh, regional chambers that work together uh, closely to promote this event. Uh, their members, staff, chamber board of directors, uh, and thank you Chief Mitchell, Premier Fury, Minister Parsons, uh, Mayor Farwell, MP Clifford Small, and of course Mr. Sprott, thank you for being here and taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Clyde Drew, which is, uh, uh, Clyde is a Mi'kmaq carver from Con River, and uh, he was so uh, gracious to give us his time to come here and do a demonstration of this carving, and uh, he also uh, donated this piece, uh, believe it or not, and uh, he's put it up for auction, silent auction for charity, which is going to go to the Central Northeast Health Foundation. So, thank you, Clyde. So this will be on the table back at the, uh, at the exhibition, so have a look at doing something for the silent auction for that one. Being from Gander, I grew up in an airport in a government service town uh, where we did little, we knew little of minerals and mining. Uh, although we were surrounded by logging, prospecting industries in Glenwood, Appleton, Benton, uh, and a pulp and paper industry in Grand Falls, we in Gander knew little of heavy industry or the mineral sector. In fact, when arranging transportation for Mr. Sprout originally, we were going to transport him from the airport, I asked my father, who was a longtime airport employee in Ganderite, if he'd be okay with driving him from the airport, and all he said was, who's Eric Sprout, do I have to wear a tie? <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, for our regions, uh, the, the, the underpinnings of our business world are, are, are shifting beneath our feet. There's, there's a vibrance in our community here now, in our region, of building energy uh, and anticipation for the future. There's so much investment here. Uh, it's a great time to be in business. It feels like we're on the precipice of some very, very uplifting times uh, in our economy, and the opportunities are going to be far-reaching and prosperous for not just the central region, but for our full province. With all the excitement that's happened in central Newfoundland in the last couple of years in this industry, we really haven't had a chance to bring everybody together at one table uh, to share in the excitement and the opportunities that this represents for us all. 
Our communities, our chambers, our governments, our regions across Newfoundland are too small to support the needs of such a huge industry individually. And it is only through collaboration and unity on all levels that this industry will thrive and our business community will prosper. And I think it's an important message for us to keep in mind as we conclude the conference today is the importance of this unity and realizing that in educating and supporting one another, we will build an environment where this industry can realize its full potential. Mr. Sprott clearly believes in us as a community, as a region and as a province. And as much as I very much look forward to hearing Mr. Sprott speak with us shortly, I think the level of investment he has made here has, does speak for itself. I'm sure he's poured over resource models and uh, reports to arrive at his decision to invest so deeply in these projects. However, he's not only invested in minerals, he's invested in us. He wouldn't have had to dig deep in his research to learn about the resourcefulness, the will, and the hard-working nature of the people that call Newfoundland and Labrador home. Look around the conference. It's filled with people, young women and men entrepreneurs, seasoned business professionals, prospectors, miners, explorers from all over this region and all over the province, and all with unique and diverse cultures and experiences to share and contribute to this ongoing success story. So thank you, enjoy your lunch, and before we do that, I'd like to welcome the Halibut First Nation Chief Brendan Mitchell to lead us in a prayer before lunch. Thank you. Before we get into a prayer and what I'd call a combined grace before we eat, I would especially like to welcome Premier Andrew Fury here today, Minister Andrew Parsons, <laughs> Mayor Percy Falwell, who's doing a hell of a lot for this community. We've had a chance to talk about it the last little while. He has a lot of great ideas about moving Gander and area forward. Thank you. Also, MP Clifford Small, nice to see you here. And of course, I was introduced earlier to Eric Sprott, and I'm looking forward to what he has to say here today. His being here is tremendous significance, really. He's a very busy individual, has a lot to do every day, but took the time to come to Gander last night and be with us here today. So thank you, Eric, for your, for your being here with us. And I'd just to say also thank you for the land acknowledgement today. There are a lot of people who are indigenous in this area, of course, and all over the island. I, I made a calculation for a group yesterday I spoke with of us to consider all the indigenous people in the province, including people who apply to be members of Hollywood First Nation, and many of whom never got in but self-identified. We're talking 120,000 indigenous people in Newfoundland on Everdoor. It, it's quite a lot. I'm really honored to be here. I've had a great couple of days so far. Hats off to the organizers and everybody who worked hard to make this event so special. And thank you to all of you for being here today. I came in just before you arrived, I looked at the room and I said, wow, this is a really pretty decorated place. But hopefully we'll have a nice meal to go along with the, the camaraderie we will share today and, and the other things that we'll, we'll have. Please stand everybody as we, we say grace. Creator, we give thanks for this beautiful day in Gander. We give thanks for all we have in our lives, in our families, in our communities. We are grateful for this opportunity for the last three days to come together in the spirit of collaboration, friendship, kinship, community, and yes, reconciliation. Creator, we ask that you guide all of us in all that we do in our leadership roles. Give strength, courage, and wisdom to all of us as together we endeavor to create a better tomorrow for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Creator, we are grateful for the food we're about to eat. We thank those who prepared it. Creator, we recognize as we eat today, or get ready to eat, there are many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians today who sit and walk in loneliness, and yes, sit and walk with hungry bellies. We are grateful for the food that we have. We live great lives in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
our communities are strong, and hopefully things will improve tremendously with the work that's being done in natural resource developments. Creator, we give thanks to those who made some very important and informative presentations to us over the last couple of days. In closing, April 28th, or April 28th is a national day for mourning in Canada. We recognize, acknowledge, and respect those who lost their lives while on the job, many others seriously injured. We ask the Creator today to give comfort and strength to family members of those people who have passed. I ask you now to join me in a moment of silence for those people who have lost their lives in the performance of their work on behalf of their families, their companies, and their communities. All my relations. Well, Alio, thank you, everyone. Provincial Minister of Industry, Energy, and Technology to bring greetings from the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Brad. Uh, before I begin, as so I don't forget, I do want to bring greetings also on behalf of my colleague, Dr. John Hagee. John can't be here today. He just had a surgery yesterday. He sends his regrets. I know Jackie, uh, Jackie is here, uh, certainly on his behalf, but uh, we miss John and uh, looking forward to having him back. Uh, I'm going to keep it very brief. I just want to say, first of all, this town is on wheels. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it's just, it was just fabulous just driving out today and you get to the center and you go in and this thing is like the first year going and you would look at something, it looks like an operation that's been in existence for a decade. It just looks so well done, so, so much activity, having the kids come in, everything has been absolutely phenomenal. And I think a big congrats has to go out to people like Amanda and the Chambers and the Council. Anybody that had a part of this, I gotta tell you, you have done a bang up job and this is just the first of many that are gonna come. Uh, so congratulations to the Central Region on putting this together. Um, I do have to throw a quick shout out, and I don't know where they're sitting, I can't see them, but I, I, I'm with the Department of Energy, uh, Industry, Energy and Technology. Obviously, we have a number of different divisions under us, but one of those, we are responsible for mining. And I have to tell you, I, I don't come from a mining background, uh, but I, I'm part of a team that is absolutely top notch and they rank up there against any mining team in the rest of Canada when it comes to their expertise, when it comes to their intelligence, when it comes to their commitment to the industry. They have been there through it. Uh, I'm really going to embarrass them now. Where are you guys sitting? There they are, right back there. Uh, folks, I, I, again, I had to say thank you to the people in IT for everything that you do. For everybody in this room, uh, we, are, we, we benefit from the commitment that you bring to the department and, the, uh, and to the industry as a whole. Uh, I know there's some prospectors here, I know there's developers here. Everybody's coming together because right now is a time like we haven't seen in some time when it comes to industry and, and the benefits that it brings to the region. That's why we see everybody here. And two last things before, because we got more important speakers here. Number one, uh, just a, a welcome to Mr. Sprott for being here. The, the Premier introduced him, but uh, I've had the opportunity to meet Mr. Sprott before, and I got to tell you, uh, to have him come down is certainly a great honor. And uh, having met him before, I don't know if you find somebody that's more down to earth, and again, he's here. I don't know if he's more worried about the industry or that bad leaf sloss last night. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but my main job here today, folks, is to uh, introduce a great friend of mine and certainly a great friend of many in this room. Um, when I got in this role, I was given this pleasure and this privilege by uh, my boss and as somebody do, that does have an interest in this sector, that does have 
an understanding of the sector and wants to be out on the ground at places like this. This is a person who wanted to come here today and to be a part of this. When we have PDAC in Toronto, he wants to be there. He wants to speak to people. He wants to speak to investors. He wants to speak to prospectors. He wants to speak to the supply and service side because he recognizes the value that mining brings to Newfoundland and Labrador. And mining is often a sector that goes on in the background. You don't hear as much about it as you hear about oil or electricity or renewables but it's the steady backbone of our economy and has been for decades and will continue to be. And right now, the sky is the limit. And a lot of this opportunity, and again, a lot of the support that we get comes from his leadership and his knowledge and his desire to continue to do more. So on that note, I am very proud to introduce my friend, the Premier of this province, Dr. Andrew Fury. Thank you. Well, thanks, Minister. Um, what a pleasure it is for everybody to gather in person again. I, I'm not sure when I'm going to be sick of saying how nice it is not to be talking into a green dot and trying to decipher many different faces on a screen uh, coming out of COVID-19, of course. I want to, of course, I have the monumental task of introducing our guest speaker, which probably needs no introduction. Uh, but let me just tell you how important a day like today is uh, for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador for our future. Uh, three years ago, national pundits had written off Newfoundland and Labrador, had written us off with no economic opportunity, no financial certainty, no hope for the future of Newfoundland and Labrador. Teetering on bankruptcy with no opportunities in oil and gas, Sinovus was mothballed, Terra Nova was mothballed, the mining sector was being challenged. They had all written us up. Well, I'm here to tell you today that we are not back. We are roaring back because we have everything that the world needs right now. We have all the ingredients here in Newfoundland and Labrador for a modern global economy. Other jurisdictions around the world can't say that. And these aren't political platitudes. These are met with hard, cold facts that not, are we, not only are we back, we are roaring back. 25,000 new jobs. The lowest unemployment rate on record in Newfoundland and Labrador's history. Synovus is back pouring cement today. The Terra Nova will be headed back to further production. Hibernia is producing. And every one of you in these seats today are here because you believe in the mining sector which, as the minister said, is not often enough out in front and center as being an important ingredient in the modern global economy that Newfoundland and Labrador has. Whether that's the ingredients to build new cities and build new infrastructure, guess what? Windmills are made of something. You all know that they're made of something. And we have the ingredients here, whether it's critical minerals, nickel, gold, it, the list goes on, iron ore, everything that you all are invested in and believe in. So the pundits were wrong. You all sitting in these seats definitely knew they were wrong. And the fact that you're sitting here today further elevates your belief in the future of Newfoundland and Labrador. I have to tell you that I have had some experience in the mining sector in the past. And while there are significant challenges with respect to mining, as you all know. There's the challenge of the resource itself, and we have a bounty of resources. There's the challenge of access to capital and equity, and it's evident by Mr. Sprott's presence here today. We are fortunate to have access to it. And there's the challenge of government bureaucracy and policy. Well, I'm here to tell you that Minister Parsons assures and ensures that we have the most streamlined process in place. I know we can always get better, and we will, to make sure that we are always continually recognized as one of the best jurisdictions, not just in Canada, but around the world in the mining sector. And that is because of Minister Parsons' guidance, his leadership, and his understanding of each and every one of you. But beyond all of those three challenges, perhaps our best value, 
perhaps what distinguishes us from other jurisdictions, perhaps what makes us so special is the alignment of all three of those critical items to introduce certainty for all of you and into the marketplace with respect to the commodities that we have here in our province. So I want to thank each and every one of you for not writing the province off, for believing in our future, for having a substantial part of that future and helping us map a modern Newfoundland and Labrador to meet the modern global demands of, of the economy around the world. So thank you. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce someone who, of course, you never came here to hear me speak, but who needs no introduction. Uh, and I could get up here and read out his CV. And you all know that not only is he one of the most uh, successful mining entrepreneurs and businessmen in our country, I think what is perhaps equally important to that tremendous accolade, and he has numerous, the Order of Canada and, and others, is his commitment to the people and communities. What's not celebrated enough is his commitment, his altruism, his philanthropy to giving back. And because it's easy to, it's not easy, but to accumulate and not give back. But Mr. Sprott ensures that he gives back, whether it's through First Nations, whether it's through supporting the University Health Network in Toronto, or making massive contributions in every community that he touches. So uh, we are all pleased uh, to have Mr. Sprott here today uh, to talk about the economic opportunities, not just in central Newfoundland, but how the interface and intersectionality of the mining sector with the global economy and how Canada and Newfoundland and Labrador can play an important role in that. I have one last thing. He, the minister and I did meet him in Toronto, PDAC, uh, when was that last June, Andrew, I think? And Mr. Sprott invited us into his home, actually. He was very kind. And he said at that time that he had been retired. And I had read all his CV going in, of course, you know, being briefed and everybody telling me how, how successful the guy is and how we, we need to ensure that he understands the importance of mining in Newfoundland and Labrador. So he, he starts by saying, you know, I'm retired. But there was a sparkle in his eye when it came to discussing and talking about the opportunity in mining in Newfoundland and Labrador, especially in the gold space. That told me that there was no way he was retired. <laughs> he was only getting going. And I think it's evident by the fact that he's here today, the first time he's had a real speech in five years, three to five years, here in Gander, Newfoundland and Labrador, speaks to the sparkle in that eye and the commitment to Newfoundland and Labrador and the mining industry. So please put your hands together and give a round of applause and welcome Mr. Eric Sprott. Yes, I'm retired. <laughs> um, I was down in Turks and Caicos and uh, I get this uh, letter, I guess, from Amanda, basically saying we have a, we're trying to organize a convention here on April 28th, and would I come? And she has mentioned to me that when I just said, yes, I will, and that was it. <laughs> she, she probably thought I was kidding or some darn thing, but... Uh, I have a, a feeling towards this province, by the way, I love being here. Uh, I love the opportunity that I'm involved with, with all the companies that uh, I've invested in. And uh, I think that what might happen here will be truly significant on a world basis, not just Canada, by the way, on a world basis. So why not try to get involved in it? And uh, one of the things I thought I'd tell you a little about myself, this is just off the cuff though, and one of the things I say is I'm in the, the business of stealing value. But I want to assure you, I had nothing to do with the heist at Pearson, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Now I want to kind of set the stage here by talking about a little bit of history first. And I'm doing this as someone giving investment advice, okay? That we live in a very complicated financial world that might be under serious stress today. And I want the first chart, where's my little thingy here? Here it is. Uh, the first chart is a chart of the NASDAQ from 1999 to 2011, okay? It went down 77%. By the way, I think this could happen again, okay? Here's the S&P, down 57. Here's a chart of Citigroup. It a low, of, they say it hit a low of 10, but I guarantee you it traded at a dollar. They did a reverse split, and so they show it at 10, because I bought it at a dollar. <laughs> Having been short, way the hell up there. Okay, seeing it coming. Here's Fannie Mae, same thing. Traded at a dollar. It, what's the high there? I can't hardly read it, but a 160 or something traded down a dollar. Uh, here's GM. Now you see, you nobody remembers what it was like in 07, 08. How how bad it was. GM traded at a dollar. I know Ford traded at a dollar because I bought them both. Okay. Now, just to give you some potential upside. Oh, look at gold. What did it do from 1999 to 2011? Oh, it was up 525% as compared to those other things that I just showed you. That is the first sense of the opportunity that we might have here in the gold and precious metal business in Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I knew I'd say it wrong. The one, there's a big problem here. It's newfound gold, but it's Newfoundland. <laughs> I'm 78, okay? Uh, the next chart is the, is the uh, chart of the uh, what's called the UE index. It went up 1,700%. 1,700. 1,700%. You don't get opportunities like this too often. You do not get opportunities like this too often. When you have a secular move in a commodity and you're, it's early days, okay? That's what we're gonna be going to. Now, now we're gonna go to today, okay? I probably should have shown this chart first. Uh, now I probably don't know how to go back, but Silicon Valley Bank, you know, filed bankruptcy three weeks ago, something like that. And First Republic, which I think is the 14th largest bank, Silicon Valley Bank, I think, was the 18th largest bank. We've lost three banks in the sort of 12 to 18 range in a month, in a month. That should concern everybody in this room. What the hell happened in the U.S. banking business that banks would go bankrupt? And I suspect that um, First Republic will have something done this weekend about it. I don't know what's going to be done by it, and I'm going to tell you why the banks are, those banks are going broke. In a bank, you have the assets and the liability. The liability is your deposit, okay? You have a deposit in the bank, that's the bank's liability. Then they take that money and invest it in various assets. Let's imagine that they lend it out to somebody on a mortgage, 20-year mortgage. They're making three or four percent. Then all of a sudden, the cost of money to the bank goes to six percent. Well, hold it now. Now I'm losing money on that asset. And if I sell it, I got to recognize the loss, and I don't want to recognize the loss. Because banks are allowed in the States to um, suggest when they have a long-term investment, they don't have to recognize the loss. But we, anybody who studied U.S. banks knows that there are potentially a couple of trillion in losses sitting on their balance sheets that haven't been recognized. And if they're recognized, it would chew up all the capital of the U.S. banking industry. So that's something that you should, it's, it's, I think it's the elephant in the room. And you, I can guarantee you, if you were in the commercial real estate business, first of all, you know the model was perfect, right? You're gonna borrow your money at X, you're gonna have so many people in the building, you're gonna charge them this much rent, then you'll have that much profit left over. Okay, all of a sudden, the building goes empty by 50% because people aren't working in offices anymore. The rent might be going down, and the cost of refinancing has for sure doubled. With one proviso, you can't get the money anymore. The bank will not lend it to you. Banks are gonna restrict lending here. 
I, and I'm not really talking to Canadian banks. I, I, it's not something I study closely. I'm more interested in what the world banking business is going to do. That's why I'm mentioning these U.S. banks. Now, I think it's sort of recognized, maybe even universally agreed, that the smartest organization in the world, the smartest, I'm talking about the smartest, and we all re recognize it, is this artificial intelligence through chat GPT. They're the smartest guys in the room. Well, somebody asked them, well, could you please define a conservative portfolio that's defensive in today's environment? And the most stunning thing was this, gold and silver, this computer, a co not a person, a computer, who's only looked at a trillion facts and all the data, says, you know what? You should own 20% in precious metals, 20. Do you know that the value of all precious metals today is less than 1% of all values of financial assets? One. So how do you go from one to 20? How do you get to 20 if you're at one? Well, first of all, we only produce 1% more gold every year. I'm sure when newfound gold st starts up, it'll probably be 5% more for the world when they get going. Um, but right now, it's only 1%, okay? And 1%, I mean, in, after 20 years, you've got 20% more gold, percent more gold, but you need 1,900% more gold because you're at one now and you've got to get to 20. You need 1,900%. And there, there's only one way to get there, and that's to have the price of gold and silver go up to get there and have all these assets go crazy and maybe maybe the UE gold index will go up 1700 percent would that get us there yes it would get us there if the UE gold index went up another 1700 percent we'd get there maybe that's what the prediction is I'll let you guys think about that okay now I'm going to talk about a topic I know nothing about gold geology I know nothing you should choose not to believe a word I say, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, these are words, you know, orogenic. Well, when did I ever hear the word orogenic? Only when I, five years ago for the first time ever. Um, and I can't read what it says on there, but I think it says, the aim of this study was written by Ian Hansberger for the Canadian Geologic Society, is to investigate whether the orogenic model for structurally controlled Archean load gold deposits developed over the Apatibi is applicable to Newfoundland and by extension other regions. And basically he said that you seem to have the geology here that is analogous to the Abitibi. Now the Abitibi has mined 190 million ounces of gold so far and obviously will mine 200 million ounces of gold. And for him to go there, there had to be a big enough structure that he could at least think that you could get to a, a fairly reasonable amount of that gold. And of course, that's, I think, what others have now said. I've read and met other uh, geologists. Uh, this is a, a picture, you probably can't see it that well. Um, and it just shows where the uh, the margins of the plates came together and created these structures in Newfoundland. And of course, the most well-known are the Valentine Lake deformation zone where there's already, uh, is it one mine operating and uh, being built for sure, and a couple more that are getting close. Uh, and then you also have the Appleton Fault, which I'm sure being here, you would know much, much more about. And it was these collisions that created the circumstances where gold could manifest itself in the ore. And that's what brought him there to think there was an analogy. And I've spoken to a, what was the guy who was called Mr. Orogeny, or Orogenic, okay? And he agreed, I mean, it's, this looks like the place. Uh, I've just listed here some of the companies that I personally invested in. Uh, I am hoping there's a lot of hope these days <laughs> that some of these companies will be able to duplicate what Newfound Gold has done and what, um, what Sokoman has done in terms of high-grade orogenic gold. Um, 
And I, I hope even that some of the companies that are on the Valentine Lake deformation zone that are now producing may find as they go deeper that there's very some significant gold underneath the open pit. Uh, probably don't need to spend too much time on the, the actual project. You're probably quite familiar with it. I know that Greg Matheson would have described it to you. The thing that I find most appealing about this project, and by the way, and he's not here, but Denis LaViolette, who's a person I know from Toronto, a geologist and the president of Newfound Gold, was the individual who decided this should be staked because this looks like a major opportunity. So he should get a lot of the credit for this discovery. And one of the things I find most intriguing about it is it's 110 kilometers. I mean, a lot of you are in the mining business. I mean, who could even ever imagine have owning, owning something 110 kilometers? I mean, that's just, I doubt that anybody owns anything that's 110 kilometers. And here we are in prime country and owning 110 kilometers. With the drilling up north, they've cover, uh, the prospector drilled over uh, five kilometers and finding very significant gold. Uh, there's your first hole, okay? 92 over 19 meters. Now I can tell you, uh, I can tell you this because I was with Kirkland when we bought New Market, which had the Fosterville property in Australia, and I was a shareholder of New Market, and we would come up with holes like this. Okay, the, but they're, you know, one in a million. I mean, these holes that are that are being announced are incredibly valuable. And I'm going to go to the value part, okay? This is the most important thing to understand what this opportunity might be. If you have one gram of gold, you got a big open pit. I mean, maybe you make 0.2 of a gram of profit, 0.2, okay? You got a 30 gram ore body. You maybe cost you two grams to mine it. You get 28 grams versus 0.2. That's 140 times more profitable, okay? That's 140 times more profitable. If it was 15 grams, it's 60 times more profitable. These are orders of magnitude that are crazy. So when you're looking at what's evolving here, appreciate the significance of the future profitability of this ore body. Now, I, I put in the latest news release from April 25th, so that's three or four days ago. I can't read it anymore, but I know what it says. Uh, maybe you can read it. Um, but it basically said we have uh, 22 meters of something like 17 grams, and I think it was uh, 22, 18 meters of 12 grams. That's my recollection. And one of the things that's interesting about that, 40 meters, okay? I always like doing this, 40 meters. Would that be about 40 meters to the end of this room? About that, right? You imagine mining something that wide? How easy is that? 40 meters? Oh my God. And that's just, you know, the width of the zone. We got the height, the depth, the strike. I'm just talking about the thickness of the zone. This is like, be a layup mining that. So that, these results are, they just continue to amaze with their results. I put down here a list of the hits. I mean, we don't need, need to go there, but I guess it's done by uh, gram meters, and some of them are like, what's the top one there, 3,000 gram meters? I mean, just out of the park. Here in Newfoundland. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about Sokoman, who's over on the uh, Valentine Lake deformation zone, who, quite frankly, the reason I'm here is because Sokoman had these stunning results as well earlier than Newfound Gold. So I was already in Sokoman, and then when Newfound came along, okay, now I get it. They got it, you got it, we got it. <laughs> okay, I, I put this chart of, of uh, Kirkland Lake to, to tell you something. So in uh, Probably before 2016, I was an investor in uh, what was it called Crocodile Gold that became New Market, and here's a mining company that was announcing they were mining three gram gold. Then all of a sudden, the announcement: Oh, we got five gram gold, we got eight gram gold, we got 15 gram gold, we got 25 gram gold. I mean, holy jeez, what's going on here? 
And of course, this turned out to be Fosterville in, in uh, Australia, the highest grade operating gold mine. And I, when we finally bought a new market, which I was a big shareholder in, but as a chairman of Kirkland, I would try to convince people that, you know, this thing is going to be so big because the profitability with those kind of grades is going to be so off the wall that Kirkland could go crazy. And I don't think I ever convinced a director to buy any. Uh, two employees, I think, bought it. Two. Everyone missed the opportunity. I don't know why they missed the opportunity. And then sooner or later, they, along comes Kirkland, they report like, we made $200 million this quarter. Well, duh, when you got that kind of grade, of course you're going to make 200 million. I don't want to get the premier too excited here, okay? <laughs> I already got the royalties <laughs> or, the, or the industry minister for that matter. Um, I should talk a little about silver. I actually happen to prefer silver to gold. Don't boo me, okay? Uh, typically when gold runs big, and I think gold's going to run big here, silver will lead the parade. So this little chart, that's only in the last uh, six or seven months, I believe. It's up 47%. Now we in the business call that a bull market. You know, when you're up 20%, you're in a bull market. We're in a bull market in silver. We're in a bull market in gold. We've gone from 1650 to 2050. We're in a bull market. Get with it. <laughs> um, I only put this in because it, it, last year India just knocked it out of the park buying silver. They bought about a third of the world's silver out of nowhere. Look at the year before they did nothing. Uh, supply and demand. Uh, this is just a chart that shows that the Silver Institute has suggested there's a deficit in silver of 200, I think it was 237 uh, million ounces last year in, in an industry that only produces a million ounces. There's a shortage of 237. Uh, now I'm going to, I want to talk about, oh, and of course we got central bank demand for gold. Uh, which is off the wall. Here's a thing from China where the retail sales were up something like 10% for the month and what led it? Oh, jewelry's up 37%. Well, well, well. Manipulation. I know lots of people don't like to think things are manipulated. Well, I'm telling you, they are. And you can read that right there. J.P. Morgan convicted of fraud, attempted price manipulation, spoofing, spoofing in a multi-year market manipulation scheme. We can see it, okay? We see what happens in these precious metal markets, how these guys run them down so fast because they get, you know, they say they're going to sell a billion ounces just like that in a day, even though we only produce 800 million ounces in a year. And one of the, the reason I put this piece in, Craig Hempke, who used to uh, interview me for Sprott Money, um, a week and a half ago said, oh, by the way, and gold was maybe at $2,030. You know, we got this option expiry coming up on Tuesday of this last week. And um, the, the, you look at the, the puts and calls and where is the best price where the dealers would want gold to close that day? It's $1990 and $1990 and silver at 25 Well, where did they close that day? Bang on 1990 and 25. And they have a description of what they're doing. It's called Max Payne. You know who the Max Payne's for? Their customers. I know you're shocked to think that. Somebody that was buying this stuff, right? It wasn't them. They were the guys that are selling, collecting the premiums. So they wanted to close here so we make max profit. But you know, if they make max profit, somebody had a Max Payne. That would be the investor. Now, hopefully this all ends someday because there is enough interest in precious metals that will just overwhelm them. And I should say that, you know, here we have the price of gold around 2000. So even though it's stunting and every three months we had to play this options game that they play, at the end of the day, the price is higher. So we have to live grin and bear it. Uh, okay, so this uh, sheet, I put it in because the financial networks, whenever they talk about some company's earnings, they always say, they beat the estimate. Okay, well, here's a company that beat the estimate. The estimate was whatever it says on there. And it beat the estimate on the top line and the bottom line. And then they tell you what the earnings were. 
oh, the earnings were down 50%. They never say that. They just beat the estimate. Well, you know what? If you're a good CEO, you get the estimate where you need it. So you can beat it. These guys could lose money and they'd still announce they're beating the estimate. So people have to look through the information. I'm probably over my time here. How am I doing there, Amanda? You're 21 minutes. 21, okay, fine. Um, what did I want to say? What else did I want to say? Uh, maybe I'll just move on. Okay, well, I got to talk about Newfoundland, right? What are the three greatest things about Newfoundland? Okay, we know about the people, right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Number two. Oh, the people again. <laughs> Who did this? I'll do the next. Oh, the people again. Oh, God. And the winner is the people. <laughs> but there are other things, and it's been the Premier and the Minister of uh, Industry have sort of focused on some of these things. Uh, the government sponsorship, which I just find amazing. I just can't believe. Now, you know, I read things where the government says, we want five mines here in, in, by 2030. I mean, what other governments ever said that? You know, they're all crickets. Um, the fact that there's exploration grants, and by the way, I think that is a very, very intelligent thing to have exploration grants. It's just that little bit that helps the guy get going, okay? And you know that ultimately, somebody else has to pony up the other 85%, right? So fine, you get 100% spent and you give up 12 and a half, but you're probably getting it back in taxes anyway. And then what if you find something? Then we can all retire early, right? <laughs> uh, the, oh yeah, then um, uh, the Geologic Association, I think, has been spectacular here. I see the work that they had done before, and you know, going out and doing soil samples and studying the geology and all. It's been absolutely spectacular. Uh, and of course, the logistics and accessibility are—you you can't beat it. I mean, when you can drive to the drill, like that's just what a wonderful environment. Uh, I just wanted to mention some of these people that uh, I trust as great advisors, okay, and maybe some of you know them, but I want to mention their names, okay. A guy named Alistair McLeod writes for Gold Money. He's just been spot on with the whole credit cycle and where we're going. Same thing with Doug Nolan. He writes a, a missive every damn weekend, and I think, geez, i got to get two hours together to read this damn thing. It's called the Credit Bubble Bulletin. He's all over it. Uh, Michael Oliver has been a very special person for me recently. He's a technical analyst, but he's got these views on gold and silver in the whole market context. First of all, he thinks we're in a bear market, okay? He called the bear market uh, Jan 22 for NASDAQ, uh, Feb 22 for the S&P. He almost jokes about it all the time, how it's, things are going to fall apart here, okay? And he mean, I mean now. It has already started to fall apart. Okay? You all saw Tesla go from whatever, 400 down to 100, then back up to 200, now it's at 160. That kind of thing. But he's been very good. He's been as right as rain and very uh, thankful for his contribution. I read a website called Zero Hedge. Uh, there was one of the key articles that today was uh, how you had to have uh, gold in your portfolio if you want to survive. That was just this morning. Danny I talked to. Uh, Ted Butler writes an article about the manipulation of silver. He sends the copy to the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Committee. He writes this every week. Sends a copy of his letter accusing J.P. Morgan of uh, being crooked, fraudulent. And he sends it to the regulator and the Department of Justice every week. <laughs> Crickets. Ed Steer does a wonderful summation of uh, uh, gold and silver markets. Now there's a group called the Gold Antitrust Committee, and I see you, oh you got both names down there, yeah. Bill Murphy and Chris Powell. And uh, I've studied them and read their stuff for the last 20 years, and they're the first ones to kind of alert me, okay, we got these banks, commercial banks, that are messing around with the precious metal market, but we're gonna get them, okay? And they've been very good on that, so they're helpful. Okay, what's the opportunity? I've written down these four things. Well, first of all, 
uh, let's deal, we're going to have a seismic survey done here. There'll be a little bit of thumping going on around Gander, right? Serious ground thumping to see what's really down there. You guys might feel that. Let me know what it's like. <laughs> um, and that, the, the reason this could be interesting is the seismic can reach down to apparently a kilometer and a half below ground. A kilometer and a half. These guys have drilled down to a maximum 400 meters. Well, what if the seismic comes along and says, oh boys, it's, it's down at 850 meters and it's even better than what you've been drilling. I hope. So hopes Eric. <laughs> um, but that's going to be very interesting and we'll start to get those results, I guess, hopefully in the third quarter. The strike extension. Strike means the length of a, of a deposit, okay? We've already got the gold in the top nine kilometers, over five kilometers. Uh, as I was walking out, you know, uh, on the, um, the property, one of my favorite people, well, how far is that from, you know, where you've drilled already and, and announced, you know, they've announced they've got something that's 200 meters on strike, 200 meters to strike. Oh, uh, that's about 500 meters away. Oh, really? Maybe it's 700 meters to strike. This makes a big difference. <laughs> it's your strike. I don't know if anybody's ever done the multiplication. You multiply the strike times the depth times the thickness times 2.6 their specific gravity, and you can work out what the goal is. So for example, that news release on Keats West, it was 350, no, 250 by 305 by 30. And by my calculation, that could be 6 million tons. Now, what's the grade? If it's a third of an ounce, you got 2 million ounces. If it's half an ounce, you got 3 million ounces. And did it ever take a long time to find? Not, <laughs> not, Two or three months of drilling to find that? Oh my God, how perspective is this thing? And I think the fact is that it's incredibly perspective. We got it on the east side of the Appleton, we got it on the west side of the Appleton, which is probably going to go deeper. Uh, it was described to me initially, it's like a feather, okay? And the Appleton is the core of the feather, and you've got all these things that come off. And there could be a lot of things coming off that we haven't got to drilling yet. Um, and of course, one of the things I'd like to see, and, and I think there's sniffs of it, is some of these other companies that are drilling on the Alpen Fault or the uh, 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 Valentine Deformation Zone come up with a newfound kind of hit. Just to prove it's, it's not just them. Because I don't think it should be just them. You know, the, 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 uh, the plates didn't know it would be just them. Okay? They might have left some for somebody else. I'm not talking about the dinner plates, okay? I'm talking about the geologic plates. Okay. Do we have anything else? No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> well, I think there's a huge opportunity. I hope people get it, that the profitability that could happen here is going to be stupendous, and I'm happy to meet the mayor of Gander. Uh, Brad, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, you put on a wonderful conference here, and uh, I hope everyone gets a lot of bountifulness out of the opportunity in front of you. Now, Amanda, am I just supposed to cut it here or am I supposed to take questions? We're perfectly at 30 minutes, by the way. So okay. Congratulations. Okay. I'll leave it at that then, okay? No, you're open to take questions. I'm open to take questions. Does anybody have a question? 78 is the answer. <laughs> 230 pounds. <laughs> well, that seems to be enough questions then, right? We have a question anywhere? Yes, somebody back there? Got a question? Can you come back next year? Ooh. <laughs> we'll find out. Thank you. Well, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to finish off just <clears throat> briefly uh, again with uh, a few thanks. Uh, thank you, Eric, for being here. Very much appreciate it. Um, Minister, uh, Premier, thanks uh, everybody for uh, being here today. A um, couple other thanks I'd like to point out. I missed our technical advisory committee earlier. 
So I wanted to give a shout out to them too. That's done uh, a lot to bring this uh, conference together. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Rally Drilling, again. And uh, to all our sponsors that's uh, made this event possible. Uh, outside of that, uh, is Al Keats here? I know he is. And if he is, can somebody at his table make him stand up? I know he's too modest too, but if you could stand up. Guys, uh, long before we were driving around here in our fancy trucks with our sport jackets and all that stuff on, these guys were, uh, Al and his, his family and colleagues were out in the, in the bush in Newfoundland. Um, I got my student up today, I'm a land surveyor, so I can appreciate maybe some of what you guys went through. Uh, if anybody here has walked through an alder bed in Newfoundland, uh, you'd understand, but these guys were out on foot, on their quads, on their bikes. Uh, picking rocks and doing building the foundations that all of this is built on. So to Al, returning grateful. Thank you. And that's about it. Uh, Clyde's carving. Just want to point it out again. Uh, beyond silent auction. So have a look at that. Our date for next year, April 23rd to the 25th, which is a Tuesday to a Thursday. So, uh, keep that in mind for next year. And just a general shout out to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we always got to give this plug, but uh, if anybody is uh, interested in membership, you don't have to be here. Uh, if you have membership in the Chamber of Commerce, it'll allow, allow you to stay dialed in on what's happening here in this region in our community. So, uh, see, see us at the registration. We can give you some information on, uh, on uh, information on registration. So that's about it for me. Safe travels. Thanks. See you next year.